Hey church, I hope you're doing well. Have you all heard that story? It's a true story, but have you heard the story about the guy, the flea market, and the Declaration of Independence? You know that one? I'm guessing a number of you have heard this before, but, but just so we're all on the same page, I'll give a, a brief recap. A number of years ago, I think it was the early 90s, uh, this guy was in a flea market in Pennsylvania, of all places, and he was looking around at, at all of the stuff, and he came across this painting. And this painting was not very nice, to say the least. It was actually pretty ugly. He described it as being dismal. It, it was an ugly piece of work by a, an artist that that nobody knew and it was old and, and bent out of shape and it was in this flea market and it was labeled for the price tag of four bucks. Four dollars for this ugly picture of a landscape. And so this guy looked at it and he thought, you know what, I'm going to buy that piece of art. I'm going to buy that piece of art, not for the art so much, but he liked the frame. The frame around the picture caught his attention and he thought, maybe I could repurpose that. And for four bucks, eh, what's the big deal? I can repurpose that frame and use it for something else. Well, as the events unfolded, he took the, the thing home and, and when he got it into the light of his house, you know, that flea market shine and appeal kind of wore off a bit. Maybe he even had a little buyer's remorse. The painting was in worse shape than he thought, had a, a rip in it that he hadn't seen. And then as he was trying to take it out of the frame that he wanted to use, it just all fell apart. The, the frame de deteriorated in his hands and he was left with seemingly nothing. But then he noticed a little something extra. He noticed that in that crack, in between the, the canvas of the painting and the wood backer of the frame stuck and stored in there was a document. And he thought, hey, I should see what that is. Before I throw this whole thing away, let me see what that is. He pulled it out and it was a copy of the Declaration of Independence. No big deal, right? It's just a copy. I mean, the real thing, that would be something with all of those signatures and to have uh, that, that would, that would be something. I mean, you'd, you'd wind up in jail, I imagine, if you stole that thing or had your hands on it because it's not open to the public to own that piece of history. But, but if you had the real thing, that's one thing. This is just a copy. Well, if, if you know the story, you know that it was one of the original copies, one of those first printings, as it were, that, that was distributed based off of the, the original. And so it was an early, early copy. Uh, of all of the ones that were made, only 23 or so other ones were known to exist. And this was, was rare. It was a rare copy of the Declaration of Independence. Only two of them or something like that have have been known to be in, in public hands. All the rest belong in museums and libraries and these types of things. So this guy found this copy of the Declaration of Independence. He took it to an appraisal and they said, well, that's, that's what this is. It's one of those original ones. It's worth a fair chunk of change. And they gave him an estimate. They guessed at auction, you'll probably get 800 to, you know, maybe over a million dollars, 800,000 to a million dollars. Not a bad return on a $4 investment. Well, it went to auction and, and as it was at auction, when it sold, it brought in $2.42 million. So a guy in Pennsylvania walking around a flea market picks up a $4 frame that includes a copy of the Declaration of Independence worth $2.42 million at the time that it sold. I imagine that you've, you've heard at least part of that story before, or a, a similar story before. I, I know I've heard this story a, a number of times, but, but when I hear it, it, it sparks a little intrigue, a little interest. I mean, there's just the, the rarity of that, uh, first of all, but then it also, uh, you know, gets my juices flowing and makes me think, oh, wonder where the next one like that is. 
I wonder where the next big declaration of independence fine will happen. And what would happen if I found that next one? And I think that's a fairly common response. I'm not so sure that this part of the story is true. I didn't look to see if this was validated, but, but I heard people say that after that, you know, there was this increase in people buying old frames at flea markets. People wondering, is there another copy? behind another ugly painting. And so they're buying all these pictures up, hoping that that hidden jewel will be in between the canvas and the backing, hoping that they'll find that hidden treasure, hoping that everybody, what everybody else sees on the outside as being ugly and worthless, that they'll find something unique and valuable once they get it home and get it open. And I've, I've been down that road myself, you know, many times. I, I've done uh, flea markets, I've done thrift stores, I've done garage sales, I've, I've done all of these things, hoping to find that item that somebody else discarded or somebody else saw little value in, but I see value in that, either for my own use or, or maybe to, to give to somebody else or maybe e even to sell and make a couple of dollars. I mean, I have made nowhere near 2.42 million bucks, but, but there's that hope that you just find that item that has that hidden treasure, that value inside that is so easily overlooked by everybody else. And this is, is possible for us because by and large, we're taught as a society to make judgments based on what? On, on if the external appearance. We make value judgments all the time based on how things look on the outside. You, you see it time after time and after time again. Two coolers sitting by each other, both of them white, both of them insulated. We look on the outside, one says Yeti, one does not. Oh, that label so handed, handedly, just handily, you choose points out the fact that this one has a higher value. That name, that label that we attach helps us establish value. Uh, that purse, they're identical, two leather purses, both brown leather, both crafted about the same, both in the same shape and style. That one says Prada, and that one says nothing. Oh, that Prada is more valuable. It has that label, that maker, that assurance of quality. And, and we've adopted this into so many aspects of life. We can judge based on the appearance of things quickly, easily. We're used to it. We attach labels to it to help us with that so that we know certain names are worth more money, certain names are worth less, certain names hold more intrinsic value, other names hold less. We're trained as a society to look on the exterior, to look on what is presented to us and based value judgments on that. And it's not just limited to objects, right? We, we know that we do this with people as well. Someone enters into the room and maybe they're wearing some of those brands or dressed a certain way and immediately we make value judgments. Oh, they must be fairly smart because they have a tailored suit and they're well put together. They must be fairly well off because they can afford that kind of thing. That person must have some level of value to society and, and also to me based on how they're presenting themselves. On the flip side, somebody walks in with a tattered suit and none of those brands that we associate with being better and we make different judgments and assertions. Uh, they must not be too smart. They must not be very hard working. They must not offer a lot of value to society or to me. And, and we do this based on, you know, different things that are important to us. If we value athletics, we value a certain look or um, type of person more than maybe somebody else. If we value academics, a, a different look or type of person will appeal to us. We have different metrics we use, but, but we learn how to evaluate each other based on external features, based on the external presentation that we're given. We learn how to make value judgments 
based on what we see, rather than looking beyond that. Today we're looking at this passage in James, and he says something about how we might do this, and how we might be entrenched in this habit. And he says, actually, you know, what we should do instead. And so we're going to look at James. Uh, we'll, we'll start in chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll go all the way through 13. And, and we'll hear this argument that James presents. And how believers in Jesus, followers of Christ, brothers and sisters in the faith, should act and should judge or not judge when it comes to external appearance of other folks. Listen to what James says. My brothers and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. James here in this section, and he has this long argument, but this is the main idea of the whole passage. Of, of all these 13 verses, this is the main thing that he wants to get across. Brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Don't do it. Don't place a higher value on, on one person than another. And, and then he'll go on to explain, especially based on, you know, external appearance. And, and actually, when you read uh, the Greek, and, and I can't read Greek, but Greek translators has, have helped me understand that. They say that the word for favoritism is prosolepsia, prosolepsia something like that. Anyway, they say that the literal translation of that means receiving the face. So my brothers and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't be receiving the face. Now you might think, what an odd uh, thing to say, receiving the face. Me, I, I think it's a cool thing to say, you know? You're about to receive the face, and then you lay on some face form or something. But, but receiving the face is similar in some ways to say, don't take things at face value, at what you see, at what is presented to you. Don't look on the external appearance of somebody and make value judgments based on that. Do not show favoritism is how it's translated so we better understand, but don't, sh don't be receiving the face, making judgments based on external appearance. That's not how believers in Jesus Christ should operate. And then he goes on to support this argument, and he says, suppose a, a man or, or a woman comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at the floor uh, by my feet if you, if you gotta sit. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? If you're having a gathering, a church gathering, or a meal or some kind of thing, and you see somebody walk in and you're like, ooh, now that is somebody. That's somebody important there. Here, let, let me give you my seat. Here, have my place at the table, or, or better yet, have the more prominent place at the table. Here, take all of this, uh, have all this special attention and then somebody else comes in that, that doesn't have that appearance of wealth or doesn't show uh, that evidence of riches and they're, they're poorly dressed in shabbier clothes and you're like, hey, buddy, uh, you can go stand over there on, on the wall. You, you can move on out. Uh, if, if you wanna sit, you know, how's the floor? Will that work for you? We might drop some food down there. You could pick that up. That, that would be more than, than nothing. Uh, my buddy over here with all the money, he gets the seat. You, you not so much. James is saying, don't act like that. Don't be that way. Don't make those judgments on these external features. And then he continues, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? and to inherit the kingdom. He promised those who love him. But you have insulted the poor. 
Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you really belong? James is saying the poor can be rich in faith and will inherit those things of lasting value. And you're giving preferential treatment in your gathering, maybe even in your Sunday worship service to those with money, the ones who are extorting you for, for extra rent, the ones who are making you work 14, 16, 18 hour days, the ones that are taking your land and uh, eating your food, you are giving them the place of honor instead of those who have been given the blessing of, of great faith. But what's the matter with you? You see, in this culture, in this time, some of those things that were described were, were, were characteristics of the very few. Not too many could have a gold ring or the fine clothing, and, and the few who held the money and the power tended to exploit those who were poor and worse off. And at this time, the, the Christian church was being persecuted, and so many of the poor were also believers in Christ. And these owners, or these uh, rulers, or these people who had these, these poor folks some suddenly having hope in Jesus, were oppressing and persecuting them. And then you have this situation where those who are wealthy are also oppressing and persecuting the poor. That those who are poor are more numerous and also more likely to believe in Jesus. And then when the, the rich person comes into the gathering, they're given special treatment. And James is like, seriously? Don't you know what really matters? That those who are worse off have been blessed with a faith in, in God. And even in our day, if you think about the church at, at large, you know, not denomination, not individual churches, but if you, you think about the church of Christ, the body of Christ at large, and the places where it's growing the most, where it's most vibrant, the places where people are the most excited and passionate about Jesus and holding on to Jesus, uh, and the church is increasing, it's in areas around the world that are poorer than what most of us here in the U.S. experience. Don't oppress or show favor to the, the rich and oppress the poor. Don't receive the face based on external experience. Instead, recognize what is more valuable, what holds lasting worth. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, verse 8 says, and, and this is what it says the royal law in Scripture is, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. If you really keep that command, then you are doing right. And, and we recognize this, this scriptural um, you know, description of what a neighbor is, of who a neighbor is. And we think about all of those teachings of Jesus about uh, the poor and the oppressed and the weak and, and those folks being our neighbor. And, and James says, if you uphold that law to love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, if you're receiving the face, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. James here is saying, you know, you, you can't minimize this stuff. God is a, a holy and righteous God. His law is whole and complete. The standard that God wants you to follow as a, a follower of Jesus, as one who puts your, your faith and your trust in God, isn't a standard in which you can say, you know, I'm going to refrain from murdering, but I, I, that adultery thing, is that really that big of a deal? I, I'm going to refrain maybe from the adultery thing, but that murder thing. Is that really that big of a deal? 
Well, James says when you, you break part of the law, it's like you're a law breaker. When you sin some, you become a sin her. You, you've broken that covenant, that, that ideal, ideal that God has for your life. And so he's saying when you show this favoritism, when you value somebody based on their external appearance, especially over and against somebody who is less well off in this scenario, in this case, you're a lawbreaker. You have sinned. You have gone outside of the plan of God. And James says again, all of this is, is saying to support that argument that he starts off with. As a brother and sister adopted into the family of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Don't receive the face. Don't show favoritism. Recognize that the true value lies within, and that comes with the things of God. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James here is saying, act as if you've been saved by the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has set you free from your sin, free from that sin when you have broken that law. God has, who has set you free by his mercy, ask that you be merciful to others and act in the same way that has been acted to you by the Lord. And, and this brings up you know, that, that teaching of Jesus when he talks about a servant who's been forgiven this incredible debt. And then he goes to his uh, friend, somebody that is under him, and, and he just rings him up for this measly little sum. And Jesus says, hey, no, no, no. You've been forgiven much, therefore go and act that way, act in love and forgive others. James is taking that idea and saying, listen, You've been set free by the, the love of Christ. This law that you're under gives freedom because of the mercy of God. So now act mercifully towards others. And how you do that, at least in terms of today's content, in terms of today's message, in terms of today's argument, is you don't make the judgments by the external appearances. You recognize that God doesn't look at this he looks at the heart. And as that is the case, that is the way that you should look to. Friends, we, we need to take a lesson here from James, from a flea market, from a dude that, that bought a copy of the Declaration of Independence for four bucks. And we need to recognize that the most important thing that anybody ever brings into our life into conversation with us isn't these things that we can see, but it, it's what lies within. May we learn to not be receiving the face, to act with partiality, to value people who seem to offer us more on at least external appearances and devalue those who seem to offer us less. May we instead learn to have the eyes of Christ and to see those who are lost and hurting and the value that is within them. May we look into the hearts of others and recognize the eternal treasure that lays within each of us. If only it's given the light and the opportunity and the grace and the love to grow. When we see people through the eyes of Christ, we don't evaluate them based on how they might help us or how they might help our community or how they might uh, please us in some way. We, end, we see them and how God loves them and wants the best for them and how they too are either a brother or a sister in Jesus or may become one. Friend, may your eyes be changed. May my eyes be changed. May we learn to live into this teaching from James. May we no longer receive the face, but offer grace and mercy and love. 
to each one that we meet. Through God, for God, by God's power and his strength, in Jesus' name, amen.